Hi, hi everyone. Welcome to Be Waste Wise. I am Shweta Dandapani. I am the community builder at Be Waste Wise. Uh, today we are going to discuss circular economy. I mean, we're going to. The topic is circular economy meets climate emergency. We have Emma Burlo, who's the founder of Lighthouse Sustainability, who's uh, moderating and one of the speakers in this webinar. Emma is going to interview Chris White, who's a circular economy specialist. We are also supposed to have Rebecca Griffiths join us, who's the founder and CEO at Primus, and uh, she will uh, hopefully she will join us soon enough. We have not been able to catch hold of her at the moment. So uh, we received your questions and. Uh, we already pass them on to the panelists and the speakers. So please go ahead if you have any more questions, use the Q&A section. So over to you, Emma. Thanks, Twitter. That's great. Thank you. Like I say, we are waiting for another panelist. So we could hear from her any time. I think she's having some technical trouble, but we'll carry on. Um, I'm really pleased to um, welcome Chris White. He's dialing in from near Durban in South Africa. So uh, we've got a, a, you know, a nice global footprint this morning. I'm in the UK, in, uh, um, in, the, west, in the west of the UK. And as Sarita said, I've um, hosted quite a few of these uh, sector economy webinars now. So the topic that we're going to cover today is one that I'm increasingly working on or being asked about, which is where does circular economy fit with issues around climate change and net zero? So quite commonly, when we talk about net zero or climate change, we instantly home in on energy and renewables and transport and building energy and that sort of thing, which is all fantastic. But we know, and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation have done some work on this, that we can't reach our net zero targets or climate neutral or any of those targets without embracing a circular economy because so much of our carbon impact uh, at a national and a global level is tied up in the resources that we use and their supply chain, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted to touch on this because circular economy has traditionally, at least in my experience, come from a waste and recycling background. And now it's kind of colliding with, with this, you know, big overarching problem that we've got. So I invited Rebecca and Chris to come and give their um, opinions on this today. So um, I think if we're ready, so we're going to start off with a poll. Are you able to? Great. Um, I just want to say we've got which, 50 participants, which is great. Uh, which one do you want to start off with, Emma? Uh, what does circular economy mean to you, please? So thanks everyone for joining. If you could break the ice by just helping us out with this poll. It's a single choice. And I'm just trying to get a view on your concept of circular economy, because I just said mine comes from a waste and recycling background. So that's my perspective. Chris might have a different perspective. So I'm just interested to know what it means to you. We can't, uh, we can't uh, participate, Chris, unfortunately. <gasps> Thank you, there's results. Hopefully you can all see that. Wow, we have an educated audience today. That's interesting to see, Chris, isn't it? Because quite often people press the recycling button almost without thinking about it. So um, the numbers have gone a bit quick, but I think it was 71% mm -hmm. regenerative, re regeneration. I can, I can share it again. Could you? Sorry. Yeah, we'll have a little talk about it. And Chris, I'd love, I'd love to see, yeah, you know, we'll kick off by um, hearing your views on the, on the poll. So I'm really, really uh, impressed by that. I think that's great. It's obvious that the audience has got a handle on what circular economy does mean. Um, Chris, any thoughts on that? Well, absolutely. Don't, none of those uh, answers are wrong. Yeah. So Sorry. just one is, one is less wrong. Um, yeah. And I think what we need to try and do is, is again, move out of that concept that, that um, it's just another buzzword for recycling. It couldn't be any further from the truth. 
Yeah, the circular economy is a multi-sectoral, uh, multi-participant um, uh, approach in terms of embracing different principles that, that have multiple outcomes. So when we talk about the circular economy, we talk about uh, agriculture, energy, water, infrastructure, waste, um, health, nutrition. These are all components that form part of the circular economy. So, you know, often we, we, we dis discharge certain elements of it that are actually part of it. So a sharing economy, um, less consumption, uh, low carbon transitions. These are all definite uh, pointers towards a circular economy. And often these can be outcomes or impacts of the different projects and developments and applications that we do by the application of circular economy principles. Yeah, great. Well, that's brilliant. A really good summary, Chris, before I even got you to introduce yourself as well. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. It's really all embracing. You know, I sometimes sum it up as it's, you know, it's, a, it's the next industrial revolution. So that the industrial revolution must have looked you know, big and complicated and all encompassing to people in those, in those, uh, in back in those days. And, you know, and, and so this will now, but the key word being regenerative is really important that we start using that because that wasn't the case uh, even five or 10 years ago, we weren't talking about at least outside of academic circles. So Chris, I'm going to kick off and um, give you a chance to sort of briefly introduce yourself, if you don't mind. Um, when did you work? When did you begin working in circularity slash sustainability? And give us your kind of uh, take on it, if you like. What, what's your what's your position on circular economy, and how and how do you help people understand it? My background really has come from uh, um, a long, diverse history. Um, I'm a geologist by training. Right. Um, I left university and started off my own company um, in GIS, which in those days was really an academic right. tool, and people said you're an idiot. Um, but uh, I did very well, um, but most of my work was done on, on the assessment of geobotanical anomalies, looking at high resolution satellite imagery. And that got me more into the vegetation side, which got into the environment, conservation, etc. So I've always been in that sort of field, um, but I was thrown into it by accident um, in 1999, when I was uh, part of the, the local chamber of business. And we had a problem with the landfill site. And they said, uh, um, please, can you do something about it? At that stage, I was the head of the Environmental Forum and City Affairs Development Forum. And the more I started looking into waste, the more I started to realize and understand that you can't look at one waste in isolation. You also can't look at it in terms of only being waste. So when um, you know, now that I've gone through you know, multiple years of, of this experience, and, and I've been doing circular economy from since long before it was called circular economy, mm. is to understand the, um, the life cycle analysis perspective of what's going on. So it's the, the requirement in terms of looking at the impact. So it's, it's a human impact, it's an environmental impact, it's an economic impact. And the circular economy really is about taking all of these buzzwords we've heard um, in years gone by. So green, sustainable, mm -hmm. um, we went from cradle to cradle, cradle to grave. Mm. Um, and now we're going into restorative and regenerative. Yeah. It, it's all part of the same thing. Um, but what we need to do is we need to understand those linkages between those different sectors. So um, I was in a chat this morning with the Western Indian Ocean Island uh, group, and they're, they're talking about the, the, the plastic issue. And I'm saying it's not about the plastic mm. issue. You've got to look at it in terms of mm. the impact with regards to infrastructure impact, um, health um, education, these are all parts of that, that same component. Mm. And I had to kind of draw the lines between, between them so they get to mm. understand those. So we've got to take this multi-sectoral approach and, and mm. you know, I'm in Africa. So yeah, we've got our biggest problem. A lot of the, the presentations that I give is I talk about the problem with circular economy is geometry. And we right. work in silos and boxes. Right. And that's basically how do you put a square peg into a round hole? But mm. uh, um, circularity is about understanding those interconnectivities. Great. So give us a little couple of minutes on what's the African Circular Economy Network all about. So ASIN, the African Circular Economy Network, was uh, established in 2016. Uh, started off as a small NPO with a bunch of people with the same ideas saying we need to take this concept and, and drive with it. We need to look at transitioning Africa to a circular economy. There's such huge opportunities to do that. 
Um, and it's grown substantially. So now the, uh, the, the network has um, over 30 African countries uh, involved. Um, we have over 130 country representatives, uh, chapter leads for different countries. Uh, we have different chapters. Uh, so there's a lot of functionality that's going across, uh, across Africa. And to different extents, you know, we're seeing that certain countries are leading. We're seeing a lot of drive from the likes of Nigeria, Kenya, uh, Rwanda, oh, um, and uh, you know, so we're getting different drivers. But it, circular economy means different things to different people because mm. there's different pain points wherever you look. So in Nigeria, for example, the biggest pain point was the plastic waste issue. And we said, okay, we yeah. understand that. But then there are other issues are energy, water, and massive urban infrastructure issues. But how did that, how do those join together? And how do you look at one problem mm. being a solution to another issue? So we've got to be able to look at, at unpacking all of those different components. But ASIN has been highly successful. We evolved from a nonprofit organization through to a nonprofit corporation very quickly because we needed the governance structures and frameworks. Uh, and that's now evolved even further to the ASIN Foundation. I'm one of the co-founders with offices in, um, it's, it's based in, in Rotterdam, uh, but now we have offices in Nigeria, South Africa, Cameroon, Ethiopia, and we're now looking at, um, at um, uh, Kenya as well. So the idea is to bring capacity to looking at what the different issues are with regards to circularity and how we drive that forward and educate people and get them to understand that that is not just about plastics or you know, the, the recycling side of things and what the impacts and outcomes are of those different components. That's amazing. And I'm so pleased to hear how quickly that's expanded because I was aware of, of the network through Peter Desmond, who I, who I know from the UK, quite a few years ago and, and you know, it's small and it was fledgling and it was you know tr sort of hanging on in there to try and get established it sounds like it's really you know taken off I'd love to hear from anybody um, in the Q&A or in the chat who is caught, you know listening today from Africa and maybe we can put you in touch touch with Chris because um, these webinars are also about you know networking as well and people quite often connect so please do drop us a line if either you've got connections in Africa that you could share um, the network with or you've got questions you know quite often we get questions about um, from people who've got operations in different countries and I think you've, what you touched on there is really interesting so people are coming at this from different points so their issue may be plastics or their issue may be water or in Africa as in lots of countries electrical waste is a you know really big driver so how do we, you know, encapsulate all that? And, and you touched on a couple of the terms, but, our, you know, I've worked in waste minimization, resource efficiency, industrial symbiosis, you know, all these things. And I think it's just important to make everyone comfortable with the fact that it's all part of the same big puzzle. You know, we're all bringing something to the table. It's not kind of, oh, we don't do water because that's not this, you know, it's all in there. I think the sooner we get our head around that, um, and not, you know, not that we have to delve with, into things differently in different silos, but the better. So that sort of brings me on to the next big, you know, terminology conundrum, um, which is all things climate change, carbon neutral and net zero. So, Chris, can you give us your view in simple terms, the connection you make between circular economy and our kind of climate goals. Big well, question, I apologize. It's, 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 yeah, it's a suitcase, suitcase question. It's, it's <laughs> gonna take a lot of unpacking um, <laughs> because it is, again, it, it's a multi-sectoral approach. And um, you know, if, if one needs to, to look at the impact of climate change, uh, everything is linked to carbon, um, which I think is, is perhaps wrong. Um, it's not just carbon. It's, uh, it's, our, it's our impact in terms of, uh, of, of land use change, uh, biodiversity. Um, these are all uh, issues that, that are um, uh, really um, putting a strain on, on, on the planet. We only have one planet. Mm. But when we look at unpacking the different sectors, very few people understand that something like water takes a huge amount of energy. Uh, we all live in, in cities, but the water doesn't come from the city. The water comes from somewhere else, which means that you need massive infrastructure and we need power to drive that water to where it's needed. Agriculture is the same thing. You know, there's a huge amount of power that goes into agriculture. 
and water that goes into agriculture and power is energy and energy is, is carbon. So how do we look at systems where we become more self-sufficient? We start looking at renewable resources. We start looking at um, biomass applications to remove mm. our, our independence on, um, on carbon-based uh, um, fossil fuels. And there are so many different ways of doing that. Um, the team that I'm working with, we're busy with a number of different projects now to look at driving the, the biomass uh, energy sector, which has huge opportunities in terms of driving and developing um, uh, sustainable development, carbon capture, carbon sequestration, and then providing an offset pro uh, product that um, is, has a coal parity offset in terms of energy with 70 to 80% less CO2 emissions. So any of those that you try to unpack Mm. We'll be able to show you the impact of carbon. The built environment is is probably the biggest one. So the built environment, right. people don't understand um, often the the impact that that has. But it is well known that the built environment contributes thirty nine percent of all carbon emissions that contribute to global climate change. And so it doesn't matter whether you're living in the UK or India or Africa. The reality is the same. So we, we need to look at the embodied energy of the buildings that we live in, as well as the energy efficiency of those buildings that we live in. And we've seen changes, and not, often we don't understand them, but you know, we've gone from incandescent light bulbs to CFLs, and, and now we realize those are poisoning the planet. So now we're going to LEDs, um, and now we're looking at, at uh, solar-based uh, LED systems, which are intelligent, um, and we're starting to reduce our, our energy usage. And I think in the UK, that's quite important at the moment. I've seen the energy costs going up about fourfold in the last six months. So I think everyone's uh, oh, feeling it. over there. But the, the opportunity in terms of energy, um, if you look at the building structure, um, we are very much involved with uh, um, conventional construction methodologies, uh, cement and concrete. Uh, the cement industry alone contributes 8% of all global emissions um, towards, towards climate change. Um, and it's an energy intensive product, but there are solutions. There are systems that uh, have been developed globally um, through the work we're doing in South Africa. We have some of the foremost scientists in the world uh, developing geopolymers, um, which is using waste streams from fly ash and mine slag to produce mm. alkali cement with 95% lower CO2 emissions. So how do you reduce that, that CO2, that embedded CO2, mm. but then also drive it in terms of the energy efficiency or the thermal efficiency of those buildings um, to ensure that we don't then spend for the duration of the life of that building 60 to 70 years so much money on heating and cooling that that um, that building so that's where energy efficiency active design passive design are all vitally important mm, so mm, mm. i can go through every single sector and unpack how it links into climate change um, and uh, i mean that goes from health to nutrition, to education, to, um, to waste. And yeah. all of those are linked into climate change strongly. So the yeah. circular economy yeah. is the solution for our, our battle against climate change. Fabulous soundbite, Chris. Remember that, we'll come back to that at the end. I, I thought something struck me while you were talking there. All of these sectors and all the, the very intelligent individuals working in those sectors, you know, there's a real challenge here for us to share all this learning. So if you've worked on building design, you're an architect, you know all about building standards, you're an energy expert. Have you ever made the link, you know, with circular economy? And even if you've made the link, how do you, you know, how do you develop your learning and that sort of thing? Maybe we'll come back to that, like in, in, in terms of how, how we make this happen. Because I've just seen a couple of questions uh, come up one of them's about sort of strategies but that's something that strikes me um, and something that I work on personally I've got a passion about is just sharing learning because we've all you know we've all done things in a certain way because that's how our sector does it um, we've got this big overarching elephant in the room now uh, so it's almost about like how do you point people uh, to, to in the right direction but yeah great answer thank you Chris really really knowledgeable clearly um, so I'm going to jump over just because we've mentioned your uh, calling in from Africa. There's a question here. Um, what is, and it's a great question, what is the NGO involvement in circular economy in Africa? Um, opportunities for barriers. In Europe, it is in large part thanks to NGOs that push hard for circular economy. 
related policies. That's how, you know, the whole movement got started was from the NGO. How is it in Africa, Chris? Just give us a perspective. Who's pushing the agenda? Very much the same. So the, right. the um, issue that we're, we're seeing is, again, the, um, the, the slow response of government. Um, government's about policies, it's about directives, it's about um, uh, legislation, um, and it takes forever for that to change, and particularly in Africa. So a lot of the big change we have seen has been from the, uh, from the NGO sector. ASIN uh, specifically is an, is an NGO. Uh, the ASIN Foundation as well uh, is also an international uh, NGO. And the push has been from interest groups, really. Um, we're starting to see a drive also with the big uh, global corporates who are having to toe the line with um, mm. strict European policies. And those big corporates often have um, their footprint in African countries and other developing countries. Um, and they can't do their own thing in that country. They've got to follow, they've got to toe the line of, of the, the mothership um, and they've got to drive those systems. Um, but we're also seeing that change with, um, if you're trying to export any products into Europe, you need to be compliant with, with their requirements also for carbon and, uh, and circular economy and, and, uh, and green procurement. So there's a drive that's been coming through there and, and the NGOs have played an enormous role. Um, I am way too busy with NGOs. So I'm, I'm part of, uh, I chair the KZN Recycling Forum, the KZN Business Sustainability Forum, the Circular Economy Club for Durban. I'm an advisor on the African Marine Waste Network. Um, I'm on the Institute of Waste Management. Um, and these are all NGOs that, that are driving an agenda. So it's useful to have those. Um, the big issue we're finding, and I think it's, it's important to note that, that we've got to start looking at working together because People are now trying to grab that space in the circular economy space. And we're starting to see people um, working against each other instead of collaborating. And circular economy is about collaboration. It's about partnerships. Uh, it's about driving the SDGs. And SDG 17 is partnerships for change. And that is the biggest opportunity. No single person, no single country, no single organization can drive this agenda by themselves. And it's about collaboration, uh, cooperation, and communication. Great, great segue into SDGs, Chris, because you're absolutely right, you know, all roads, you know, lead to the same place. And I absolutely agree with you, we, we cannot afford to see any level of competition, or, you know, proprietary ownership of things or whatever. And it, it's something I'm very passionate about that I think, you know, we must share openly. It's almost a shame that that fault that you know that level of effort falls to the NGO sector you know um but I really liked your point about the African European connection so you know talking to the mothership I think that's a a really good takeaway and that probably is the same in other countries as well it'd be great if anyone's got any examples of that um, I'm going to take another question from from the floor because uh, you know I, I want I want people to keep giving us as many questions as possible. What strategies? And you mentioned government, and I've got some opinions on on this too. What strategies do you believe governments need to take in order to push a circular economy narrative? Um, I ask in relation to the current crisis seen around the world concerning the use of conventional resources. So. Yeah, you touched on the speed of legislation there. What, what strategies would you advocate, Chris? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, <laughs> the biggest strategy that we're not seeing is we're not seeing collaboration across um, silos. And, and I think that's the biggest issue. So uh, if you look at, at South Africa as a prime example, we have um, one department that is signing all these climate agreements. So we're signing the Paris Climate Agreement, we're signing UNFCCC and we're making all these promises and then you have a different organization on the energy side which is driving the coal agenda um, which is collapsing and, uh, and, and, and um, really battling to keep up with demand. So we've got to look at that transition so that the issue we're seeing in terms of governments trying to, to make this change is to look at overarching policies that, that are um, embracing the principles of circular economy across those different sectors. And, and that's not what we're seeing. Um, in Europe, we're definitely seeing it now. And I think it's taken them 20 years to get to understand 
how they bring the uh, policies and structures from one component or one sector into another. Um, we've got a lot to learn in Africa, but we are seeing some really nice examples of that. So um, there's some great policies coming out from, from Rwanda, uh, Nigeria, Kenya, uh, in terms of driving the circular economy focus. But the link is to create that direct um, uh, comparison and, and, and draw that into bringing in how that works with the private sector, how it works with civil society, how it works with the knowledge sector, um, and, and how all those different stakeholders work together to be able to understand that a policy is not just a system of um, thou shalt do this. Uh, it needs to be implemented, it needs to be monitored, it needs to be audited, it needs to be adapted over time. And that's often the problem that we, we see with, um, with, with legislation. The legislation is too restrictive and it's too open to interpretation. So if you've got a good lawyer, it's a lot easier to, to reinterpret law in terms of your own um, requirement. And we see that quite a lot in Africa as well. But that requirement in terms of collaboration is important in terms of driving mm -hmm. that narrative. So we need to push that far more. Yeah, I agree. I agree. In the legislation I've been involved in, some of the plastic bans work and that sort of thing in the UK is frustrating because it, it's very narrow. You know, so we went, you know, went ahead and, and banned a few single-use plastic items. But they were, you know, the, the, the whole, all the work, and I was involved in pulling some of the evidence together, was very narrow in its range and scope. So therefore, it didn't take in the bigger picture at all. And, and people sort of start to see these things as a bit token. So we'll, we'll kind of, you know, we'll ban cotton buds, but we won't look at this bigger, much bigger issue, you know. Um, it's not a criticism because I know that's due to the structure and that's the way it has to work. Um, and also, you know, the power of, of, of um, consultation. Your consultation is an amazing thing, but it allows the strongest lobby to have, you know, the strongest voice. So, um, so yeah, I think power of collaboration um, and remembering SDG 17 is, is really important. It should maybe come first. You know, if, if you can't do this without collaboration, take it off the table. Really interesting. That's great. So I'm going to move back to my questions. And this is a sort of timing topical question. We've got a big event coming up in November, and we're lucky to be hosting it in Glasgow in the UK. What do you personally think is going to happen, Chris, with circular economy? slash climate change there has been some rumblings and i think adam reed has been done the webinar here about how resources aren't as much on the agenda maybe as they could be so how do you see this topic evolving over the next couple of months i'm actually quite encouraged by some of the stuff that i've, I've seen through um the picc reports and things that are coming through so there's a lot of knowledge that is coming behind the decisions that that, that are coming through there's a lot of science behind it yeah so i think the connection is there with the academics and and the uh, and the main role players who are going to be in glasgow um i'm very positive in terms of what they're looking at the issue is politics uh, and that's always the problem is trying to get alignment from a political perspective um, and, and this jealousy issue. You know, it's, so it's, it's like you know, um, you know, America saying, why should I do that if China's not doing it? But that's not the point. Just damn well do it because you should be doing it. Um, and yet we're also seeing a misalignment of policies. So we're also seeing China saying, yes, we're absolutely we're going to drive um, for a zero carbon thing by 2060. But they're investing billions into coal power. Uh, and investment across Africa and Asia. So, yeah, what they say and what they do are often two different things, and that's politicians, mm. unfortunately. Um, what we do need to get out of this, and, and I think um, there's been a lot of uh, hesitation, stumbling over the last 20 years uh, since Kyoto in terms of understanding carbon financing. Mm -hmm. And carbon financing really is an opportunity to look at a balance between the haves and the have-nots. Um, so there are opportunities in terms of driving the carbon agenda where you don't have a resource base, but you could then borrow off another organization or company or country that has the resource base to be able to look at that balance across the system. And that's where it's important that we have that collaboration. But we also need to get them to understand that it's not just about activism. It's not about you know, stomping your foot and saying no more coal. Um, you know, the reality is, is that... Um, 
we have systems technologies and, and knowledge now how to make coal-fired power plants carbon neutral. Um, we know how to do it. So how do we implement those systems and practices? Um, you know, the, the reality is, is that getting coal out of the ground is actually the dirty part, not so much what we do with it afterwards. But again, that's about understanding the systems and the technologies and, and the knowledge that are out there. So often it's about getting the decision makers out there to embrace technology. We're um, a pretty clever planet. We've managed to engineer our way into this mess. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm convinced we can more. engineer a way out of it. So um, it, it's what I'm hoping for is, is that there's a linkage through the, these latest talks to stabilize, first of all, the carbon markets that so we understand where we're going from. Mm. We can look to carbon sequestration projects with a level of confidence, which we haven't been able to do for the last decade or so, and get to understand the way forward that is also looking at, at not only multi-sectoral, but interconnected globally. So one country cannot do it mm. by itself. It's got to have its own systems, but we need to work together. So that means cross-country collaboration as well. And, and that means politicians need to pull their what's-its out of their rear ends and get together and say, right, how are we going to work together to, to make this change? And, and as I said, we know how to do it. The systems mm. and the technology are there. Let's just get on with it. Yeah, absolutely. I had a fascinating conversation last week with really experienced innovation um, coach, I guess, you know, somebody's worked in some really big companies, lives in California, and we were talking about Silicon Valley. And I said, imagine this, and he, he's, he's worked, his career's gone through sort of digitization, that era. And I said, you know, imagine the resources that went into Silicon Valley to move us from analog to digital. Okay, based not just Silicon Valley, but every country, but driven by this enormous kind of machine in, in, in Silicon Valley and a desire and a want and an investment. I said, imagine if we did that, you know, and his, his eyes just lit up and he said, yeah, he said every con company on the planet has embraced digitization, apart from, you know, a, a small minority. But even if it's a mobile phone that you take payments on, you know, you've, you've embraced it. Um, and so I think, you know, we talk about transformation, but it, I found it really useful to actually hook it back onto something. The industrial revolution is too far ago. People can't remember what it was like when we got steam, you know, so, but we can remember when we went, lots of us can remember going from analog to digital and, and particularly if you've run a business during that time. So I see it very much as moving into the next era and you have to take it um, as seriously as you took that. So that was a fascinating conversation just about how do you suddenly gear up but I like your point, Chris, about you need a confidence base of that. You need, um, you know, a firm foundation. And we're a bit rocky at the moment. We're a bit rocky on finance. We're a bit rocky on collaboration. Certainly rocky on politics. I don't know if we're ever going to solve that. But once people seem to get a firmer footing, you know, possibly next year, we'll start to really see some see some transformative things. I that's, that's fabulous. Thank you for that answer. Wow, the questions are coming in thick and fast. So I'm going to go over here. They're much better than my questions. So um, we have got a question here about the private sector. So let's go from government to private sector. And I have had this question quite a lot in the last couple of weeks myself. Uh, this is from Maria. Private sector is complaining about a, lot, a lack of funding and resources that would help them escalate efforts towards circular economy, e.g. technology needed for recycling plants or whatever. They're mostly looking for external funding uh, since interest rates within their country are very high. I'm not sure what country you're in, Maria, but that's probably a, a, a global issue. How can this challenge be tackled? And is that a mindset thing, Chris? I'm just gonna throw that on the end. So private sector asking for funding. It is a big issue, and, and, and you know the, the simple reality, if I look at, at funding a lot of the projects that we're doing, if, if I was going to the bank and I was saying, I'm going to invest a million dollars into a cookie factory, it's a lot easier to invest because the banker understands what a cookie is, they understand that people need to eat, um, and they, they, they understand the system. When you start talking about uh, um, hydrolysis applications through dissolution in converting plastic waste into high value fuel systems, they go blank. Um, Understandably, maybe. <laughs> yeah. 
So, so there's a there's a technology gap um, in terms of the the conventional financing systems okay. and, um, and and where we're coming from, uh, you know, as as innovators to bring projects to the table, and that is an issue. Um, you know, recycling, as uh, as uh, Maria mentions, there is is getting better because it's you know more understood what's happening with with recycling. But also recycling has also been shown that it's not the silver bullet, that um, recycling itself is often not economically viable. Um, so there's risks again. So funding them is very difficult. Mm. And that's where we need to look at understanding all of the different components from a corporate perspective and a government perspective to understand the life cycle analysis of the benefit of moving this way. So when you look at moving waste from a landfill site into a processing facility, one should be looking at the fact that you are saving on transport, that you are diverting waste from landfill, which is saving landfill uh, costs and, and air, airspace costs, that you are removing um, elements harmful to the environment that have impacts on our health, that you are driving um, opportunities in terms of new skills development, that um, you know, we are looking at new product outputs that could potentially offset import costs and, and uh, have a healthy impact on our balance of trade. So we need to understand all those impacts. And again, that's what circular economy is all about. It's about understanding not just the, the, you know, the, the piece of toast that's in front of you, but you know, where did the wheat come from? How do we get the wheat? Who, who ground the wheat? Um, you know, how do we move it from A to B? Who made the bread? Where's the bread made? All of these things are very important in terms of understanding the whole life cycle analysis so that we start to get conventional funders to work with governments to understand that. And it means that we need to look at a blended financing because mm -hmm. banks are going to be nervous for a long time. They always are. But government needs to stand in in terms of the, the social and the environmental benefits. And governments need to stand in terms of their, their contribution towards uh, developing a sustainable future for their consumers and being a responsible provider. Those are all components that allow us to start looking at how we fund these different things. And we're starting to see that. We're starting to see these different funds coming through. We're starting to see a focus on green economy um, and circular economy applications and new funding uh, applications coming through. And even still, um, organizations moving away. We're seeing banks saying, we're gonna move away from, from coal. Uh, we're, we're gonna diversify away from oil. Um, and that's all fantastic, and it sounds like it sounds like a great idea. But you know, they're just responding to what what's actually happening, and 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 they need they need to know that that um, you know, when the guys in the oil fields are seeing all these new electric vehicles coming through, they're sweating. Believe me, they're going okay. Um, you know, we're we're sitting on a time bomb here. So it's how you diversify and work together and, and look at understanding those things. But the funding is always a critical issue. But believe me, there are a lot of resources out there. First thing you do is do your homework and try to find out what the different funding opportunities are out there. Yeah, hundred percent. And I really like the idea. I mean, I, I often when businesses do ask me this question regularly. In fact, I've got a, I've got a thread on LinkedIn. So if anyone at the moment on this very question, so if anyone has got any idea about funding, real funding opportunities, then head over to my LinkedIn and put it on if you can find the thread. Um, but that's about funding, right? So when you talk about external funding, but internal funding, there, it, you know, there is money. You know that. We, I've just talked about digital, you know, so we can find money for certain things that we want. So I usually shift this conversation, and you touched on it a bit there, Chris, to priorities, you know, and what are you going to prioritize? Either you can make some savings in your own business through circular economy, you know, that's quite possible quite possible that's always possible in pretty much every business I've ever been into so I've just worked with a company for example and they've saved so much on the, I know it's been COVID but they've saved so much on their fuel bill they're going to change their transport policy they're going to fly less they're going to drive less with the money they're putting in electric charger points now two years ago when we talked about it there was no budget for electric charge points so those that's a tiny example and you're talking about a couple hundred thousand pounds but they've actually just internalized that but I liked your view more generally about health, about well-being, about food systems, you know, um, and I think that's really important that we look a little bit outside the box and we don't just say it's a recycling plant, you know, or it's a reuse repair outfit or whatever. But um, massive education challenge for that whole sector uh, to get their head around, like 
how do you put a value on some of those benefits? But as you've said a couple of times, Chris, we know how to do this stuff. We're not trying to reinvent the moon. We just need to put the right experts in the right place, you know, connect to the right people. Fabulous. Okay. Rob, we do a lot of work with businesses. I'm going to stick on businesses for a bit to identify and investigate circular economy business ideas. Me too. Great. What well a Rob. Uh, to help them become comfortable with the economic sustainability side of things and changing their offerings. Can Chris give us any examples of similar implementation of CE business models at the ground level in Africa? Everyone loves examples, Chris. Let's go for it. What, what have you been working on late, uh, lately? We're definitely seeing um, a lot of applications in terms of uh, uh, this changing. And um, you know, from a business perspective, for example, we are seeing a massive push now. And again, as electricity gets more expensive, suddenly people are going, hang on a second, maybe I should be putting in LED lighting. Um, I should be putting in variable speed drives. I should be looking at, at how I look at my hot water management, my steam management. What do I do with my waste energy? Uh, and they start to understand the economic value of that. And that's changing mindsets. So, so the, the economics are often driving that change. Um, but we are seeing big applications in terms of industrial symbiosis. Um, uh, South Africa is, is quite advanced in terms of that, and it's had huge, uh, huge impacts. Um, but also we're starting to see guidance coming through from quasi-governmental type organizations. So in South Africa, we have the National Cleaner Production Center, and they look at these issues in terms of how you look at efficiency. And that's really about reducing your water needs, your energy needs, uh, reducing your waste costs. Um, and, and corporates are seeing the benefits of that. And again, we need to understand that, that, that often a corporate won't see that conventionally. And, and, and it's a, also a lack of skills. You know, we've got every company has now got a sustainability manager. But the number of times I see that the sustainability manager has either you know, been promoted from health and safety or from um, marketing communications and they're not really sustainability professionals so they do business as usual and they try and sugarcoat things but they, they don't look at it from a helicopter view with the, the outside perspective and understand where those losses are in the system and that's where you need professionals to come in and say right you've got a problem here in terms of your uh, your input feedstock this is how you're, you're doing the wrong thing in terms of your management of uh, of your wet waste or your dry waste or your space um, or the resources in terms of your energy. So there, there's a lot of things that are coming through there and the more people seeing what the neighbor's doing, the more they're saying, right, we need to get involved with that as well. Yeah, yeah. Also at a, at a broader level, sort of like the stuff we've done recently now in, uh, in Nigeria, in terms of creating a circular economy business platform, um, where we're bringing together those different stakeholders and all of a sudden they're going, hang on a second, my problem is not just my problem. My neighbor shares that same problem, but then, my problem might become their solution. So we're starting to see this exchange um, and it really is taking on quite nicely. And I'm very excited about the future of circular economy um, within, within Africa, but it's driven by finance. Business models driven by finance and circular economy is the answer. Great, good stuff. That's amazing, thank you. And I think the next question, well, see, there's two, a lot of people wanting to know about Africa. I think Africa's the, you know, that's going to be the center of the circular economy. Uh, kind of hat tip to Europe for getting us going. I mean, Africa's taking up the baton. <laughs> so um, what's your take on waste to energy projects that are pushed in Africa? You tell me, you know, are they pushed in Africa? Oh, yes. No, they are pushed in Africa and uh, badly so. Um, I, I can even see where the question comes from. A, a, a good colleague of mine, Mr. Shimani. Oh, right. Uh, Okay. So right. I, I know exactly where that's coming from. And, and we do tend to differ in, in our answers. So the large scale waste energy systems, absolutely not. They will never work in this country um, or in Africa or in any developing country because we don't have the collection systems. We don't have the waste characterization systems. Right. We don't have the market offtake for the energy or the heat side of things, which is half the energy input. Um, we have a very high volatile um, 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 characteristic of waste a lot of organics okay. it's not the solution it's not the solution for for africa it's not the solution for for any developing country but there are some amazing technologies that are happening at the small scale so looking at specific um, problematic fractions like old oils um, uh, unrecyclable plastics 
-hmm. And those can be put into small systems. We're developing systems at the moment that are as small as, as 50 kilowatt output uh, waste energy systems. Now now you can look at, at, a, at a, a distribution center, for example, taking on its own waste, um, making sure that you maximize what's going into the recycling sector that is recyclable, but then mm. use the non-stuff, the non-recyclable stuff and make sure that that's not going to landfall. So it has a place, but not in terms of the context of what we've seen in Europe with these massive waste energy systems, just not possible, not economically viable locally. Interesting. Yeah, so we're going through a similar journey in the UK and I'm sure other, other EU countries where we, um, so I live in a, in a county called Gloucestershire, it's a fairly rural county. Um, and so the, the, the biggest project, biggest finance, the most money that's ever been raised in the history of our county has just gone on a waste to energy plant. So talk about putting all your eggs in one basket. It's, uh, yeah, so um, it, it solves an immediate problem um but it doesn't solve a future problem yeah so uh right so that's fascinating thank you and just finally another just the final sort of africa question before we start to come back round to sort of the more general um you know which how, how can we help uh move this this forward um and i touched on this earlier because i'm, I'm familiar with a couple of projects in africa is the electronic waste sec recycling sector uh in africa is it really possible to measure the circularity in this process, in a process that's as into informal sector. So, um, and I guess, you know, this is the, the case in, in lots of developing countries. There are lots of projects or, you know, really successful um, mechanisms going on. And I guess this is a question about how do we measure whether that's useful or not working? You got any examples? Definitely, I think it's it's a huge opportunity, and, and you know the e-waste sector is is a prime example of that. You know, um, right. in South Africa, we're at about ten percent recycling, and 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 it, it's not based on on the fact that that we don't have people who want to recycle it. It's based on the flow of material. Uh, it's the right. lack of education. Yeah, okay. So we're driving that through systems. Uh, there's just been an e-waste ban uh, that came into effect in uh, in August this year, and and that now starts to drive systems. But then we need to work with governments and uh, and corporates to look at the asset disposal strategies and how they follow duty of care and and take it through the right systems that that are uh, compliant. But what he's talking about in terms of circularity with the informal sector is very important. Um, we rely in the developing countries very much on the informal sector being the key point of where the waste comes from. And, and um, depending on where you are in Africa, that'll range between 60% and 95% of all waste that's getting into the sector is coming from informal collectors or what we would call pickers. Now, I am not a supporter of um, trying to promote slavery, uh, modern day slavery in, in any country. And, and I believe that's exactly what it is. We need to look at better systems, better formal systems that uh, are taking people out of that informal economy so that we have material flow where we can look at formalizing those jobs into decent jobs where people are um, uh, employed, skilled and developed in a, um, in, in, in a 21st century manner. Um, We've got to try and stop promoting pickers um, and start promoting the development of the circular economy. How do we take yeah, those people, skill them, and bring them into an entrepreneurial type opportunity where they become suppliers into the system and not the bottom of the pyramid that's constantly abused? So the circular economy provides opportunities for that process, and, and I think we should all embrace those to try and make sure that we drive this transition forward. I don't want to see in 10 years' time um, landfill sites in Africa covered with thousands of people in, in inhumane um, uh, situations, picking waste out, out of dumps, it, it's, it's inhumane. Um, we can do better than that. Yeah, that's great, Chris. And I can see Sveta, uh, Sveta um, agreeing. I had the pleasure of being in India a couple of years ago and I heard about a, uh, a couple of great projects, uh, large scale projects to uh you know to bring this informal workforce into a more formalized system to pay living wages and to you know to provide education and that sort of thing um hugely successful yeah you know just just a no-brainer that one you know it's like uh, you know it, it's it's an opportunity and to bring this back around to climate change kind of inequality is the you know the biggest um 
you know, outcome of climate change. You know, we can't avoid that. Um, so why not embrace that and take that opportunity to say, you know, do you know what? We've got to look at climate change, but we've got to look at it in a socially uh, equitable way. Otherwise, we're just reinforcing all the damage that we've been doing for 50 years or 100 years. So um, that's been great to put that that mark out there, Chris. And 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 someone's put in the chat actually about uh, the one planet living model, which yeah. integrates circular economy with health, happiness, equity, and local economy. So if if people haven't checked out the one planet living model, the SDGs again are a really good model, which says you know we need to inter integrate equality into everything we do. Great. I'm going to. Um, take one more question. So we're going to move on to, you know, what advice would we give, you know, to people on the uh, in the audience today? So what advice would you give to someone wanting to know how circularity can help them reduce their carbon footprint? So imagine, and you mentioned you just landed in a sustainability manager's job, carbon footprint's your number one thing on your desk. You know, how do we get people who have maybe been trained in energy, renewables, building fabric, even transport, how do we get them to uh, start embracing circular economy as a means to reduce that footprint? It all starts at home. Um, the simple reality is, is that I know people who are in the sustainability and recycling business who don't recycle at home. Um, <laughs> you know, there's people who talk about the water issues, but they're not harvesting rainwater at their own houses. Um, yeah, there's a lot of people who are moaning about it, but they're not doing stuff about it. So it all starts at home. Um, and the, the the big reality is, is that is that uh, consumers vote with their wallet. So if we want packaging to change, first of all, we need to understand that issue, but we need to be able to go to our local supermarket and say, I'm not gonna buy your eggs because they're in a thermoform PET uh, structure, which is unrecyclable change, or I'm gonna go to another shop that does. That does. So, so that's that's one of the key, key components. Mm. Um, but then also to engage and talk to others because nobody knows everything. Um, I don't know everything. You know, I've got a great network of people within the African Circular Economy Network who are far cleverer at me at, at specific requirements. And so when I need answers, I go to them. Um, yeah, exactly. So it's communication. Understand who is out there and who's doing what. We, we, we all need to know and understand from a broad perspective. And that's why this sort of thing is quite useful to say, listen, what is circular economy? How do we look at this thing from a yeah. bigger perspective? Where do I start? Perspective? Yeah. Take a helicopter view of, of circular economy. And it's not about recycling. It's not about this. It's not about that. It's about all of it, um, but we need to understand the interconnectivities between those and how we drive this as a primary force of change to make mm. this a planet we all want to live in. Um, I need to make sure that my kids are still going to have a planet um, and, and their kids. And uh, at the moment, we're doing a pretty bad job of that. So um, mm. stop talking uh, and, and get on with it. Yeah, that's good. And I, I think the two, and I'm really interested to see what happens after COP, because I think the two worlds of uh, circular economy and uh, carbon management, you know, just need to, we need to just get on with it and merge because we are still stuck in waste and resources and these guys are still stuck in energy. Um, and if, as you've put over so brilliantly today, Chris, the whole lot is, is you know, one big combobulation. And the sooner we open our eyes to that, and the sooner, you know, it's a big thing to get your head around. But I think once you kind of get it, you're like, yeah, okay, all paths kind of lead to the same place here. And I often talk about not being, you know, not waiting for perfect. And I say to businesses, don't wait till you've got all the data, you've got all the answers, you've got it all lined up. You know, A, someone else will have over, potentially overtaken you by then. You'll have missed your first mover advantage if, that, if that's your, you know, the reason you're doing it. But B, you're going to learn on the way. You know, so I quite often just say, let's go back to first principles. If you're making something more efficient, if you're reducing resource use, if you are making something better um, from a pollution point of view, less toxic, if you are improving the social value in your product, you're not going to go far wrong. It's going to reduce carbon along the way. Okay, and people are like, oh, right. I thought I had to be able to count it all. In a yeah, yeah, you do. You, you, you will get there. But um, we, you know, I, I'm seeing quite a few businesses who are kind of hanging back, waiting for the answers. And so I, you know, my my advice would be 
dive in, have a go. Guess what? Some things will fail. You know, that's how innovation works. But have a very, very open mind as to who you need at the table. And I was just saying to a company I was with yesterday, you know, invite somebody who you never would consider coming to the, a board meeting. You know, someone who's an expert in biodiversity or a child or whatever. And they were like, why would you do that? Because they give you a completely different perspective. And I think if the energy guys and, the, and, and us from the circular economy world can work much more closely together, you know, I'm not an energy expert, you know, so I, I'm just like you, Chris, I immediately pick up the phone and ask people who are carbon footprinting experts. Um, so we need to start working, you know, much more collaboratively. Exactly. And the important thing is that people need to understand a lot of people out there are saying, how does it affect me? I, I don't care. Um, you know, it doesn't affect me. Yes, it does. Um, it affects you in every way. So it affects you in terms of the house that you're living in, uh, the materials that you're exposing yourself to, the food that you eat, the air that you breathe, the water that you're drinking. These are all components that are going to affect you directly. So nobody can stand back, whether you're an individual or a corporate and say, it's not my, not my issue. I'm going to wait to see what happens. Um, do something now. Yeah. yeah, and I think COP might have a, a might in the same way that Blue Planet did. I'm I've got high hopes that COP, it, you know, it's going to be on our news. It's going to be um, a lot of noise for a, a couple of weeks, probably more. Um, and I think if if we can get that, if we can have that kind of Blue Planet effect again, to say actually this is me, but now it's about the whole planet and it's about climate change then um, certainly, you know, a few more pennies are going to start to drop. So one very quick question, we've only got a couple of minutes, but it's quite a, a big, wide ranging one. And I'm going to try and sum it up. Economists embrace global carbon taxes as a key solution to climate change. So carbon taxes, are we all going to move to a carbon economy? Are we all going to be taxed on carbon? Um, and would that help, you know, the circular economy develop? What's your view, Chris? There's no silver In bullet. Two, two minutes. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's no silver bullet. So, so absolutely, a, a, a structured and a stable carbon platform is certainly going to help us in terms of looking at different project developments, and it provides a certain level of impetus. My focus is, first and foremost, focus on projects that are going to save carbon and be more economically viable without having to rely on any carbon credits. If you can't do that, think twice about the project. Um, there's a lot of bigger projects out there that would require a carbon financing to be economically viable. And those are more on the social good um, than, than on the sort of economic uh, drive. So yeah, there's, there's great technology out there. As I said, from an engineering perspective, we can manufacture fuel out of the carbon dioxide in the air. It can be done. Um, it's just not economically viable. Um, so yeah, if we want to try and drive unsustainable factors using a carbon component, we need to understand it's not going to be around forever. Um, yeah, that, 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 that financing is, is important first and foremost to make sure that it's economically viable without relying on carbon finance. If it comes in as a bonus, I would like to see carbon financing driving social and environmental change, not mm -hmm. economic change. So if, if anything comes out of COP26, or COP26, I would love to say, yes, absolutely, let's look at carbon financing, but let's put that carbon back to the people, um, back to the planet. Fabulous. What a great point to end on, Chris. Um, there's a couple of minutes. I just wanted to take that time to say thank you, Chris. It's an absolute mine of knowledge. And I think a couple of people made uh, comments there. So we've never worked together till today. So I'm really thrilled um, that you've joined me um, and shared your knowledge with us. Uh, I'm sorry to a couple of people who asked questions that we didn't have time for, but we've got one minute. If people want to throw any questions and, and Chris and I can get back to them, we're happy to do that. Um, also, if you want to, you know, pop your name or your LinkedIn to, to network with a couple of people, pop that in the chat uh, in the last minute or so, because I want to try and encourage people to talk a bit more uh, about the topics that we've covered today. Um, so thank you all. And um, Twitter, over to you. Thank you, Emma. Just adding to what Emma had to say, if I, I see that a lot of people want to connect with Chris and Emma. So, uh, they're available on LinkedIn. I'm sure you'll find them there. Yeah, so LinkedIn please go fun. ahead and look them up. And thanks a lot for being a very engaged audience. Uh, thank you, Emma, and thank you, Chris, for your time. So this webinar will be up on our website in about three weeks' time. So you will all get to know if you've signed up for our newsletter. So please go ahead and sign up to it. All right. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Pleasure. Have a good day, all.
See you again. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Chris.